So we're going to move on to talk about uh, rock failure now. And this is uh, sort of almost everything we've been working up to in this class, learning about stress and strain so that we could learn about constitutive models and pore pressure. Right? So we could learn about constitutive models, things that relate stress to strain, right? so that we can then use stress and strain to define or understand when rocks will fail. Right? And the reason we care about rock failure is because we care about things like faulting, we care about things like hydraulic fracturing, we care about things like wellbore stability. And you know, sort of certainly prior to the last 10, 15 years in the advent of horizontal wells and, and which really led to hydraulic fracturing, wellbore stability was the principal application of reservoir geomechanics. And so uh, yeah, so we're gonna talk quite a bit about wellbore stability. So we're gonna learn about how rocks fail and uh, I, I think we won't have, we won't actually get into the actual first failure model in this class. That'll be in the videos uh, that you'll have to watch in, in, in my absence on Wednesday and Friday. So we're gonna talk briefly about the types of tests we do on rocks and I think we've, we've hinted on them so far We've also, uh, you, you've been doing labs, so you've seen a couple of these tests, right? Um, but for the first one uh, is the hydrostatic compression test. So th in this case, the, the rock sample was placed uh, in a triaxial cell, right? That's what we call these things. Right? So placed in a triaxial cell, and this is something where we can control the pressure on the outside of the sample, right? So this is typically put into a fluid bath and then there's some type of uh, mechanism to increase the fluid pressure which squeezes the sides of the sample, okay? Um, and, you know, typically we squeeze the, you know, if, if we just pl place the whole thing in there and, and, and uh, increase the pressure, of course, it's gonna squeeze all sides of the sample hydrostatically, but then we don't have a way uh, to control the other axial motion. So typically w what the way this is done is there's you guys have done an unconfined compressive test, right? So you, you put the sample between two platens and you squeeze the sample, right? So the way these tests are typically done is the same way, right? So if your sample is fixed between two platens and you can control the displacement or the force of one or both platens, moving this load up and down, the force up and down on the sample, at the same time, this hydrostatic pressure is being applied to the out outside. And so to keep the material under hydrostatic confinement, you have to ensure that the force that you're pushing on the platen with is equal to the force of the pressure bath on the outside. Right? So you, you load up the pressure bath on the outside and at the same time you, you increase the force on the platen so that the material is under hydrostatic confinement. So in this case, all the principal stresses are identical to one another in this test. Okay. So the unity axial compression test, or the unconfined compressive test, this is what you guys did in the first lab, right? So in this case, the sample's unconfined, S2 and S3 are zero, there's no load on the sides of the sample, and then you just squeeze the outside of it. In my opinion, <laughs> in terms of rocks, this test is basically useless. And, it, and it's useless because of, because of this. Rocks, look at the difference in a 35 MPA increase in pressure and how much different the rock responds. In, in geomechanics, and, and even in civil engineering or something else, the, the, the rocks are always under confinement. There's always some hydrostatic confinement. So you always have to have, you know, you always have to consider the pressure, the external pressure on the rock. And, and it vastly uh, alters the response of the material. So to do an unconfined compressive strength test, it's, it's, it's quite useless. Because ultimately, we want to predict rock failure. 
but this is not the real strength of the rock in a, in a real setting. In a real geologic setting, there's always confinement. And so, but the, unfortunately, this is like, you know, if, if you just go in and ask your lab technician, what's the strength of that rock? He's, the default answer is going to, you know, if he's got enough experience to know sort of how strong the rocks are, the answer he's going to spout out is the unconfined compressive strength of the rock. Right? It's the most common test done because it's the most, uh, it's the easiest one to do. Right? You, you don't need the specialized equipment of triaxial cells and all that other stuff. Right? Sort of any standard test frame can do this test. And so it's the most common, and in my opinion, quite useless. So what we call triaxial compression is not really triaxial in the sense that we don't, we're not controlling three different axes of loading. Triaxial would imply that we're, we're controlling three different loads, right? Tri. What, what we actually do is we load up the sample in the pressure bath, right? And we have our platen that can control the force on the, the axial load, right? But instead of now, instead of controlling that load to the same pressure as the external pressure bath, we vary it. So now we have a different load in the S1 direction than the S2 and S3, which are equal. So in this case, uh, S1 is greater than S2, which is equal to S3. Those are the principal stresses. So this is our triaxial compression test. You know, this is the this is the sort of um, next most common test, if you will, if you actually have the ability to do triaxial cell triaxial experiments. So if you have the ability to do this type of uh, pressure bath loading, then this is the next most common test, the, the triaxial compression test. So then there's the triaxial extension. It's sort of the same misnomer. We're not really controlling three axes independently. And there's an additional sort of misnomer because extension implies like we're pulling on the sample, right? Kind of implies that you're like gripping the, gripping the ends and pulling on it. That's not how we do these tests. So in a triaxial extension test, you do probe the tensile response of the material, but you don't actually do it by physically extending the material per se. In a triaxial extension test, what you do is you, you apply the external pressure bath, and you apply a compressive load, a compressive load in the S3 direction. Right? Typically, you do that simultaneously so that you, you kind of start the test in a way, in a way that's similar to uh, a hydrostatic compression test, right? So, you know, increase the pressure on the, on this in the pressure bath. At the same time, increase the pressure on the platen, deforming the sample in an isotropic compressive way. Then, you release the load. Right? You release the load in the S3 direction. So the sample is actually in fully in compression in a way that, you know, rocks are strong in compression. Right? So it's, it's fully in compression. Then I release the load, and that, that will stimulate a tensile response in the sample, releasing the load, and the, and the sample will fail. It will fail in that, in that way. It actually fails. In the, so you, you actually, you know, again, this is an all kind of misnomer because it's not really three axes to begin with. S1 and S2 are the same. And then you're not really pulling on the sample and, ex and extending it. There you're, you're, should be some type of, uh, you know, triaxial compressive release or something like that would be the more appropriate name. And so these are the most rare of experiments because hardly there's very few uh, sort of uh, standardized equipment that can do these type of tests. But this is the true triaxial test. So in this case. The, you know, you can actually vary S1, S2, and S3. So you, you have some type of uh, load frame that, that can apply loads in all three directions. And, I mean, these are, these are pretty hard tests to do because the, the equipment to do them is, um, you know, it's, it's, well, 
So you guys in the lab, you're, you're testing fairly small samples, like one inch diameter samples, right? Those are really, uh, in terms of a rock, those samples are kind of on the small end of what is appropriate. Because when you have very heterogeneous materials, we're, we're trying to probe the sort of bulk, the, the bulk material response, right, of the material. So if it actually has sort of varying, you know, uh, mineralogy, and, and that's that's done, you know, if it's, if it's very statistically distributed, right, sort of a normal distribution of all the all the mineralogy over the whole sample, then you can assume that that's sort of the average material response. But what you wouldn't want is you're, you know, testing like if you say you had some uh, some rock that was a made that was made up of clay and quartz. Well, you need to have a big enough sample that the quartz is sort of equally distributed throughout the clay. Uh, although, you know, because if you were to say have a really small sample where, say, 90% of the sample is just quartz and the 10% clay, that's going to be a very different material response than, you know, if it's the other way. Uh, uh, quartz is much much harder and much stronger than clay. Right? So, when we when we have these samples. Uh, for rocks, they, 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 they have to be fairly large, much larger than what we need to assume like statistical distribution of material properties in a metal. And so if you were to test something like weathered granite or something like that, this is not a typical sort of hydrocarbon bearing sediment, but nevertheless, if you needed to do a test on a weathered granite, you need a fairly, fairly large sample size. And so you, you might actually find yourself testing samples this large, you know, like three, four inches in diameter with an L over D, you know, of two. So it's a big sample. And, you know, rocks are strong in compression, especially if you put them into hydrostatic confinement or tracks are loaded. So if you want to test the sample all the way to failure, you need a giant machine right, that can apply ex extremely large force. So if you go out to pickle, they actually have machines that can test, you know, they can, they can you know, um, you know, it's 100,000 psi test apparatus, and these machines are like as tall as this room. Enormous load cells, right? and now you need three of them to, to, to probe all. The, you know, do a tr you know true triaxial test. You need some way to probe, and it, so it's just very, very difficult to do these type of experiments on rocks. Uh, you know, for very small homogeneous rocks, shales, something like that. You could you could probably get a, you know get away with something smaller, something like this one inch diameter samples like you use in the lab. But for a lot of rocks that are more heterogeneous, to get the bulk response, you need big samples, you need big equipment to test those samples. And so it, you know it really prevents doing experiments like this. So I had prepared to talk about this, but there's no way we're going to get through it in the five minutes left. So I'm just going to.